a fantastic session, two studies on climate finance. Um, uh, the first one is on net zero carbon portfolio al alignment. Uh, Patrick Bolton is going to present, and this is joint work with Martin Kaspersik and Frederick Samama. And then in the second presentation I'm going to, I guess, uh, introduce afterwards. But we have a discussant, David Serbib, who is at EDEC, um, who will discuss the paper. So thanks so much. Thanks so much for your willingness to discuss and your comments. And Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, can, can everybody hear me? Great, so let me start with some uh, preliminaries before I, I jump into the paper. Um, so, first sort of a word about uh, ESG, uh, and uh, the point I want to make is that um, ESG is uh, really uh, a response to a government failure. I think that's important to keep in mind. And the government failure, you can see here on this chart, annual uh, CO2 emissions worldwide have never stopped rising. There was a tiny blip uh, during COVID, but they just keep on rising. Uh, and, uh, and so that uh, largely explains uh, the rise in ESG. And ESG 20 years ago was a niche uh, a sector and um, Today represents 130 trillion of assets under management. Uh, at, at least that's the, you know, broadly defined, the assets under management of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. So how how do uh, investors, how do institutional investors think about a climate change problem? Uh, I, I would like to say that a good way of framing the problem for investors is as a risk management problem. At least that's a sort of a narrow definition, if you want, uh, 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 around which you can uh, get pretty broad consensus. So risk management means uh, investors will seek to hedge climate change risk, they will demand compensation for holding this risk, and they will engage with companies to induce them to reduce this risk. So I've done research both on engagement and uh, on compensation, but what I, what I will uh, talk about today is primarily uh, hedging. And uh, the point here is that reducing exposure to carbon transition risk uh, is uh, uh, justified purely on prudent risk management grounds, right? So divestment is often discussed uh, uh, in, in corporate governance circles, whether that's a good idea or not. But the point I want to make here is that just from a point of view of risk management, prudent risk management, there is a case for divestment. And that's sort of the case uh, I want to make uh, uh, here. Uh, before I delve into the paper, let me, let me mention a, a few initiatives uh, that have uh, uh, come up recently. Uh, one is the uh, Asset Owners Net Zero Alliance. Uh, another one is the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Uh, yesterday we heard about the Net Zero Insurers Alliance, and we heard that Generali is both a member uh, and a leading member of the Insurers Alliance and the Ma uh, Asset Managers Alliance. Okay, and so then you might ask, well, for generality, what does that mean to be aligned with net zero? And then you, you look at what these alliances say, it's pretty vague. Uh, so here I've, I'm quoting from the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. They say, asset managers are committed to support the goals of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And they're committing uh, to, uh, or they commit to set, setting interim targets for 2030 consistent with a fair share of the 50% global reduction in CO2. Okay, you might, you might ask, what does that actually mean? And then when you look at the list of the asset managers and you see they include all the major US asset managers, you wonder exactly, well, you know, how, how seriously should you take this? And in fact, I think you should take it seriously. The, the members of the alliance, of these alliances, have to take it seriously, but they haven't yet taken it seriously. That would be what I would argue. Okay, so, uh, you know, one way to see that they are not really taking it uh, seriously is that uh, when you look at the carbon footprints, uh, 
of institutional investors, whether you look at carbon footprint direct, you know, scope one, scope two, or scope three, it's, it looks pretty flat, right? So this is uh, four, four uh, figures here. Uh, they, uh, it's, it's just a, a different breakdowns. All countries, North America, Europe, or Asia. And you see, it's pretty flat. I mean, it, it moves up and down a bit, but there's no major uh, uh, reduction in the carbon footprint uh, visible yet. And this, this goes, for those of you who can't really see this small print, this goes all the way to 2020. Okay, so in the paper uh, the, uh, that um, uh, I, I've co-written with uh, Martin and uh, Frederick, we are, we are proposing a particular strategy to be net zero aligned. That's what the paper does. Uh, and we are looking at the problem from the perspective of a well-diversified investor who takes the world as given and who aims to reduce the carbon footprint to net zero by 2050. Okay, so that's the goal. And uh, the, the problem that uh, such an investor faces is that the, if you're well diversified, you, you're, you're holding a, a, a large market index. If you're well diversified and you want to be net zero aligned, the tension that will, uh, you'll be facing is that the companies that you're holding in the index, they are not net zero aligned. So at some point you're going to have to shed some companies with high emissions to be able to be net zero aligned. That's the tension, right? So if, if companies themselves in the portfolio are all net zero aligned, many companies say they are, not clear that they are, but many say, many say that they are, if all the companies are net zero aligned, you don't have to do anything. You can be a passive investor, just hold the index, and you're fine. But our, our uh, um, uh, assumption is that the companies will not be net zero aligned, and therefore you as an investor will have to do something to make the portfolio net zero aligned. And then the optimization problem for the investor is that you want to be as diversified as you can while being net zero aligned. Okay, so you're going to try and construct a dynamic, uh, decarbonized portfolio over time with minimum tracking error uh, with respect to a, uh, a market index. So first, what does it mean to be net zero aligned? Uh, here we're taking a stand. We're, we're uh, saying that uh, the world has a carbon budget, so this is not controversial. This is uh, from the IPCC. Uh, they estimated uh, that the carbon budget the world has, uh, and uh, if the world wants to avoid temperature rises greater than 1.5 degrees centigrade, the world can't emit more than 300 gigatons of CO2 uh, as of 2020. That, of course, we're now in 2022, and so that number is lower because uh, you know, as uh, for example, IEA does this uh, does these calculations. Every year, we're basically con uh, uh, emitting uh, uh, something like 31.5 uh, or higher uh, gigatons of CO2. Okay, so that, that's the number for 2020 here. So basically, the carbon budget is shrinking, and uh, uh, we're saying the portfolio is net zero aligned if the carbon footprint of the portfolio is shrinking at the same rate as uh, the global uh, carbon budget, okay? And uh, so, um, concretely, what that means is that this is our main, our main scenario. We're looking at uh, uh, slightly different uh, uh, variations, but our main scenario, we're looking at a, a, a carbon footprint reduction trajectory, which uh, uh, starts out with a a uh, 25% reduction uh, in the beginning, the first year when you, you, you put in place the uh, low, low carbon portfolio, and then you reduce it at a rate of 8% until 2050, okay? And then we're putting constraints on how you, you can uh, uh, decarbonize the portfolio. Uh, you have to maintain sector allocation, plus or minus 2%, uh, and uh, um, 
the, uh, the idea is, you, as I said, is you, you want to maintain diversification to uh, uh, minimize tracking error. But you want to be uh, 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 within a carbon budget constraint. Okay, and so, um, so a tracking error is calculated, is estimated uh, uh, um, using the MSCI Europe, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, the, the paper, the main portfolio, the main index we're looking at is the MSCI Europe. We're also looking at other indices and we're using the uh, Barra one risk model uh, to calculate our uh, uh, re uh, returns and the deviation of the expected returns from a, from a benchmark uh, index. Okay, and so the main takeaway of our analysis is that uh, for even for a very large portfolio, we're looking at a portfolio of $1 trillion, uh, sorry, 1 trillion euros. Uh, now it's the same. I mean, the exchange rate is on parity, so, uh, uh, but when we wrote the paper, the euros were still worth more than dollars. Uh, so, so, you know, that's a large, that's a large portfolio. You think of, uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, you know, if the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund w were to do what we are prescribing, they could do it, and they would pay a very low uh, tracking error cost. Uh, uh, it would be, uh, for the MSCI Europe, 0.08% uh, in 2021, rising to 1.9% 1 .9 in uh, 2050. And, and the results are similar for the MSCI World Index and the MSCI Emerging Market. Uh, benchmarks, okay? And so this is what it looks like if, if you want in a picture. You can see here on the left the, how the, uh, um, the carbon footprint of the, of the market index is reduced by 25% in the first year and then uh, uh, a geometric rate of 8% thereafter uh, gives you the carbon budget shrinking, uh, uh, that's the gray area, and then you see the tracking error on the other other uh, picture is very low in the beginning and then it grows, of course, over time to 1.9%. Uh, uh, the other uh, noteworthy uh, uh, feature of this uh, dynamic decarbonization strategy is that uh, you are able to say over time which companies you're going to shed from the portfolio. So you can tell companies if you're not reducing your carbon emissions, you'll be out of our index by year X. And so here you have, for example, the different years when you're, you, when you're uh, you know, dropping a company and you can see here that any will be dropped in next year. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's, a, uh, that's something companies don't like to hear. Uh, so, uh, so that's, a, that's a, 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 an attractive feature. And the other important feature of this uh, general framing is that you can tell that you know, time is of the essence here. The longer you wait in decarbonizing, the higher the rate of decarbonization. And I'll have a, a little bit more to say about that uh, uh, in, in a couple of slides. And then uh, another uh, noteworthy feature of uh, how we're uh, framing this is that you can, you can uh, think of the transition risk uh, that investors face in terms of uh, how far away uh, their, uh, the portfolio, uh, their, their carbon footprint of their portfolio is from the pathway. And that tells you at some point they're gonna have to make a sharp adjustment and that's going to carry a, 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 lot, of, uh, a lot of risk. Um, but, um, so on the, uh, on the uh, question of time, so, so basically what, I've, what we've outlined in the paper, this is uh, uh, some uh, relatively recent news, you can see here September 8th, so S&P has now launched a bunch of indices that uh, basically pursue this strategy, okay? So uh, this is uh, it's a family of uh, indices called the S&P Net Zero 2050, carbon budget indices, and what they do is essentially uh, what I've described, what the, uh, how we described it in the paper. So the 2022 series, which has now been launched, the vintage, has an initial reduction in carbon uh, uh, footprint of 25%, and then will reduce carbon emissions further 10% per year, 
Uh, and the point is, this is how uh, S&P pitches this uh, solution to investors. Uh, they say that it provides an alternative tool and index-based approach to measure climate and environmental-related risks and returns in investment portfolios. And the, uh, the, the, pre the president of S&P Global Sustainable, who has, you know, is, is uh, in charge of this initiative, uh, Richard Madison, explains uh, this uh, uh, initiative as follows. It is essential that investors have access to simple, transparent, and scalable tools to support their decision-making and we are proud to be launching this new series of indices to support investors in navigating the uh, transition to uh, a sustainable future. Okay, and so here, here's, the, here's the different families. So S&P 500, uh, S&P Global BMI, S&P Europe BMI, S&P Developed uh, BMI, and S&P Emerging BMI. All of these have now uh, a uh, a, a, a portfolio, a new index constructed, the carbon, 2050 carbon uh, budget uh, uh, vintage portfolio. Okay, and then the, the novelty relative to what I've described is that they're going to do the rebalancing every year and they're going to take the latest emissions data into account. So that's a superior design than what we describe uh, uh, in the paper. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, uh, I think I've illustrated here, at least with the solution I've described, that climate finance is a risk management problem, uh, and uh, that the greater the deviation of a, uh, the portfolio carbon footprint is from the net zero uh, uh, footprint, the greater the transition risk exposure of the portfolio. Uh, and, uh, and so the pitch here is, uh, that good risk management means aligning portfolios uh, with net zero goals. And I'll end on that. Great. Thanks so much, Patrick. And right on time, actually you're early. Maybe that's the threat of, you know, the Swiss moderator here. Um, thanks for being on time. So, um, David Serbib. If you don't mind. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here um, and uh, allowing me to present uh, this uh, discussion of this very interesting paper from Patrick uh, Bolton, uh, Marcin Kalpersik, and Frédéric Semama. Um, so, in briefly in a slide, um, what they do in this paper, they minimize the tracking error of a portfolio with respect to a benchmark subject to a decarbonization pathway. And I think this paper is great for several reasons at least three main reasons. The first one is that they propose a very simple and efficient approach to decarbonizing benchmarks. So it's very concrete and useful to practitioners, and actually this is what practitioners are, or many practitioners are doing. The second reason is that it's highly flexible. Uh, you can use several scenarios, uh, and you can therefore account for scenario uncertainty. And the third point is that um, it also allows uh, um, to uh, strengthen engagement with companies via this expected divestment schedule that you decide ex ante. And in addition, uh, last but not least, the paper is very well written and very pleasant to read. Uh, since the paper is already published, and congratulations for that, uh, I thought that my contribution would be probably more useful in offering um, new research avenues uh, to build upon this, uh, uh, this seminal paper. So, uh, and coincidentally, uh, uh, it turns out that I've been working with uh, two colleagues uh, building on your work, Patrick, so I've been thinking about, uh, about this topic uh, a little bit. So I will present you several avenues, some of which we are working on currently. <clears throat> so I guess the first uh, uh, thing is to, uh, th that we could do is to formalize a little bit uh, 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 the problem in a dynamic uh, uh, framework. For two reasons. First, because we would provide an, uh, an optimal solution over the whole period. And the second reason is that we would understand a little bit better um, how the weights, or not better, but we will understand how the weights, the optimal weights, change with respect to several variables, especially how the weights change with respect to climate scenario trends. So for this reason, we could 
uh, that's how we suggest to uh, um, uh, um, uh, model uh, uh, this uh, problem in dynamic framework. So we would minimize the expectation of the sum. Uh, so alpha should be after the integral, sorry. The sum between today and the final date of two things. First, the tracking error between uh, your portfolio and the benchmark. And second, um, you want to make sure that the emissions, the cumulative emissions at maturity, ET, or very close to your target, E star T. And you weight that with alpha and one minus, one minus alpha. And you do so under the probability P, and P being your own scenarios or the scenario you want uh, to use to minimize that. So those, this could be uh, uh, the way to formalize uh, uh, the problem in dynamic framework. Um, yeah. Right. Okay, and if you're happy with that, we can add a second layer. So we could now account for scenario uncertainty because we do not necessarily know what will be the trajectory uh, over time. We could use a mixture of several probability measures. So P star will be a mixture. You can think of a, a combination of several probability measures and optimize under this mixture of uh, probability measures. What's I think interesting here is that we can get a semi-tractable solution in both cases. Now let's add another layer um, we might probably want to minimize the turnover of the portfolio, uh, either because we want to minimize the liquidity risk or the liquidity cost. So we can add this third term where we want to minimize as well the change in the sum of the absolute value of the weights. So we don't want to change much whether we uh, buy new stocks or sell new stocks. Or the second case is more about the change in cost of liquidity where C changes over time because you can have spikes in liquidity costs, for example. But this third term could be added to the, to the problem. A, new, uh, a fourth layer is that we could account for the impact of emission scenarios on asset returns. As you know, if we have a very uh, um, stringent scenarios, scenario where we, where we no, no, okay, not a stringent scenario, but a constant decarbonization pathway, it will be different from uh, keeping on emitting today and then sharply decreasing the emissions. And this would have different consequences on asset returns. So we want to account for uh, uh, these, uh, these effects, uh, which will have consequences on the volatility of these stocks. And recall that the volatility arises in the expression of the tracking error. So we could uh, 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 use different covariance matrices within the, the expression of the tracking error to account for uh, the emission scenarios on the set returns. Then let's add an, uh, a fifth layer. Of course, investors are heterogeneous, so they have, they have strategic interactions. And we could say that the P percent of sustainable investors may want to compensate for the fact that the one minus P invest regular investors do not take into account uh, um, climate issues. And as such, they may want to set a more stringent target, E star star, that is more stringent than the target they had initially, E star. That's the first uh, um, possibility for strategic interactions. The second one is that investors could take into account the fact that since they all have different preferences about whether they want to buy stocks, it will ob obviously have an impact on expected returns and volatilities. So we could also take into account these expected volatilities with heterogeneous preferences within the tracking error, so within the covariance matrix. Um, I guess finally, this is the sixth layer. Um, since there is a very interesting feature in your model where you, you, you allow investors to engage with companies, we could say, okay, well, let's choose a portfolio that allows us to engage as much as possible with companies that are sensitive to, uh, to this engagement. So we could say, let's try to minimize the uh, engagement costs. So some companies that may change with a higher probability have a low engagement cost and the, the other ones have a high engagement cost. So we could have a fourth term where you want also to minimize the uh, uh, engagement cost where E is a vector and DW is a vector as well. Um, I will I have a couple of slides to finish. So I think there are kind of interesting extensions also on, um, on this study um, in an empirical framework where we could try to back out the average scenarios that green investors are pricing. If we use this model and we apply this model to uh, um, the benchmark low carbon funds that exist, for example, at Amundi, but in other places as well, we could look at what these funds are doing to have the weights they use, W star, and try to back out the average scenarios they have. Also, it could be interesting to compare this empirical analysis with experimental evidence. So, run a survey with the same people and see what they say and what they effectively do and how they deviate in terms of 
the pathway they want to follow and the pathway they effectively follow. And let me finish with this line. I guess if we take one step back and try to think whether we want to build this um, green market cap weighted indices or invest in green indices. So in the first case, we track a market weighted index by making sure that it's, it's, gr it's green, if I may say. In the other case, if we just uh, invest in an index that is tilted toward green stocks and that's all. I think that's a probably interesting question to, to address because in the, in the first case, when we, when we use green market cap indices, um, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, I changed that, but I shouldn't have changed that. Okay. So the, in the first case, um, uh, what, what, what Pro Patrick proposed in the paper, it's probably more diversifies that green indices and probably less risky. So that's one of, I think, major advantage. And it's also, yeah, okay, I understand why I wrote that. It's also more common for investors because, well, they, they are used to following the S&P or the Euro stock, so they keep on following the S&P and Euro stock, but they, they green their portfolios. In the second case where you buy a green index, so you buy an index that is tilted toward green stocks, it's probably easier to implement for, for a fund manager. And the question I raised, this last question is, maybe it may offer an easier signal for companies wishing to become greener. If we say to companies, well, if you are green, you're in the index. If you're not, you're not indexed. So I think there is a trade-off, and I don't really know what's best, but it could be interesting to, to explore which kind of index is the most efficient in, in terms of real impact and incentivizing companies to, uh, to green. And congratulations again for this great paper. To respond. Uh, well, congratulations on your, on your paper. That's very interesting. <laughs> and you framed, you framed, uh, you framed it. You, you have a more general framing, which is very, uh, very, yeah, very, very useful. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so on, on your final point about green indices, um, that you could also say, well, our goal is to be as green as possible, as quickly as possible, but subject to low tracking error, right? That's another approach you could take. Um, so as, as I mentioned, uh, we've, we've framed it very simply, just a hedging problem. So you want to shed risky uh, companies in terms of carbon emissions. But then the next question is, when you, when you shed that, that, that stock, what do you, where, where's your money going next, right? So this is where the green index uh, question uh, uh, comes up. Um, so. The, the, the general point about all of these approaches is that uh, you know, there's a critical role of index providers, MSCI and S&P mainly, because they do the work for the investors. And the passive uh, investment share in capital markets is huge. And uh, if you're a passive, most of us are passive investors, we're holding some market index, and by doing so, we are actually brown investors because all these indices are very, you know, biased towards brown companies. So, um, you know, I think, uh, pr I hope I'm speaking for many of us in this room. We would rather be passive investors, but not so brown, right? Maybe a little bit greener. And, and, and this is what, this is the entry point of all, of all, all these uh, indices. But there's, a, there's, of course, much more that can be done. And I'm expecting much more to be to come out in terms of new products along the lines you've, uh, you've described. Would you like to respond to the response? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. May I open it up for conversation? Um, Colin? by the trillion dollar companies. So that if the trillion dollar companies follow a desired track uh, to net zero, then one can achieve what one's seeking with really relatively little change in one's portfolio. If they don't, then it's very hard to achieve. So a lot would seem to depend on the response of those companies in terms of uh, the extent to which they pursue such policies. But then if, if they do, um, they may not account for the 
a large proportion of the total CO2 emissions, in which case um, one's still not then uh, producing the total change in output of CO2 that one wants to do. Um, so I, just, I was just wondering to what extent is the behavior of particular companies particularly significant in terms of the results that emerge? Yeah, uh, so, so that's really a sensitivity analysis question. Um, so we've, one thing I should have said, uh, said more clearly, we make the assumption, working assumption for our scenarios, that companies will not change, will not uh, significantly reduce their emissions. Um, but you can, uh, you can put in different assumptions. You can say some companies will reduce their emissions faster than others, and you can uh, then play around with whether these are large companies or small companies, and then you know do the analysis the way uh, the way the way uh, it was described. I think as a working assumption to say that companies are not reducing their emissions as a sort of like a zero uh, 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 hypothesis, it's pretty good. I mean, we haven't really seen significant reductions. That's the reality. Hopefully that will change. <laughs> can, I, uh, can, I, can I sort of, you said, I have a similar question, but maybe a little different. Um, so uh, if you, that graph that you showed at the first slide of carbon emissions, uh, I think it's misleading because if you had broken it into China, the US, and Europe, you'd see China has gone up exponentially, tw exponentially um, and the US and Europe are going down, maybe not as much as you want, but they're going down. And China's now double the combined US European admissions. So taking the point that we have, which is the MSCI, which is actually loading up now more on China, uh, very controversially. Um, and I think the, the beauty of your index is it's, is, is it's a tracking index. Is, isn't there just gonna be a substitution effect where all this will keep migrating to China and the MSCI will get out of whack on your tracking, and actually India now is going up exponentially. So it, it, what it will do is just focus on the European and US companies and just drive this to uh, China and India as it is doing now and, and where it's unregulated. So just quickly uh, on, on this point, Th these indices can be based on these low carbon uh, indices can, can be based on emerging market indices. That's what S&P has also introduced, right? So that includes many Chinese and uh, Indian companies. So you're picking stuff up there through, the, through those indices. And the other way you're picking up your concerns is that you're not just looking at direct carbon emissions of, uh, of constituent stocks, you're also looking at scope three. And scope three will include a lot of, you know, think about Apple. Apple has a lot of scope three uh, from Foxconn, and uh, it's all based in China and, uh, and in India, right? So the, the leakage problem that, you know, industrial activities are in China versus the, the US and Europe, you can pick that up through scope three uh, emission measures. Set up separate companies, and I mean, it'll migrate at the company level, not at the stock level. I mean, if it's cheaper to emit, and China's allowing you to emit, they'll just emit there, which is what's happening now. I mean, and you'll lose your tracking error. I mean, and, and so, so I just, I just think you should think, you know, three dimensionally. Next question. Okay, thank you much. Uh, Guido Führer from Swiss Re. A great, great paper. Patrick, congratulations, but also a great uh, extension from, uh, from uh, the discussion. Maybe one point which uh, it's a bit linked to the last point, uh, risk-based, or the green-based green, green based versus kind of green capital-based. Uh, my question is, you, you look at the tracking area, whatever the index is, but let's say from from an investment point of view, you will clearly also be interested how big is the concentration of the underlying index? Because we know if you go extreme green, 
you, uh, new risk and com coming back to your hypothesis, uh, decarbonization is kind of a risk management, a hedge tool. And that's why what is the right kind of measure, what is the right mitigation, which is the right basically concentration risk which you accept. That's why track and error may maybe looks acceptable, but if the benchmark itself leads completely different concentration risk, maybe you even add risk. Maybe that's one, one uh, aspect which you'll be interested to explore. And personally, I think we don't get away with kind of capturing CO2. Also, that's probably wishful thinking that all companies will achieve at net zero based on their own action. That's why uh, you need to kind of reverse the whole thing, going short, basically taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, to which extent uh, this impacts your analysis? From a risk management point of view, you could argue it's also a risk management tool. You go into that direction, and that's why the whole trajectory, but also the, the way will be massively influenced. Yeah, no, that's a, those, that, that's a great comment. So everything is net zero, right? So that does include all the other stuff, uh, de you know, uh, ca carbon capture and sequestration and so on. But we're making a very simple assumption. We're saying constituent companies are not really net zero aligned. That may be a wrong assumption we'll see over time. Uh, and so then you'll have to redo the whole analysis. Now what, what S&P is now introducing with their families is that they're going to redo this every year, right? And they're going to also introduce new vintages, 2023, 2024. This is a whole new approach to index uh, construction. So I think, I think what's, what's uh, interesting here is how, how in a way, you know, what S&P has, has start, you know, they're now the leaders in this, has uh, started doing, is really offering a, a, a concrete way forward for all these uh, asset management, net zero uh, alliance uh, promises, and flexible. They can, they can adjust, uh, adjust the tool. And the concentration in the index, but it's great uh, if such indices yeah, so are provided. Concentration will how, how about the concentration within the index? It will, so, the way the, the, the decarbonized index is constructed is you, you have fewer and fewer stocks in the index, and that's why you have higher and higher tracking error. But the point is that the tracking error is not crazy. It's manageable. And if you're worried about excess concentration, you can go the way uh, you suggested. You can uh, not just shed companies, but you can add companies, maybe do a mixture of a uh, of a standard index that you de first decarbonize and then you add uh, some green, green uh, stocks. So there's a bunch of things you can do. Jill? carbon negative companies in my portfolio, and does that offset, and does that, that, that then allow me to keep less carbon friendly companies in there that might add diversification or, you know, or add returns, you know, and, and to what extent can you, you know, I'm not an empiricist, so I can't do the modeling or the analysis, but I wonder if that's something that these models could be expanded to take into account. You can do that. You can do exactly what, what you're suggesting. We'll see whether, you know, now it's a question of supply and demand in the market. Unfortunately, these, I, I, you know, the, the first generation of uh, low carbon indices has been introduced um, 2016, okay? How large is that segment in the index market? It's still very small. So there's a, there's a next question is the supply and demand. It, and it's a, I find it a bit puzzling that you know, university endowments, pension funds, a lot, a lot of long-term investors, you know, including, there's a big debate in Norway now, should NBIM do this or not? Now, NBIM, they've been sort of saying, well, we don't, you know, we don't want to look, look at this too closely, but then there's been a debate in parliament saying, well, maybe you should look more closely. So there, there's a, 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 from my perspective, uh, too much inertia in, uh, in the asset owner community uh, in, in moving in the, in, the, in the direction of something that is attractive from a hedging point of view and doesn't cost you in terms of lower returns.
right? So that's the puzzle. Is where, where, the demand side, I think, is there. Let me squeeze in one more question. I think, Hannes, you had a question. Yeah, is this... Uh, just a quick question. The, the opposite of risk management. Uh, I yesterday by chance read a, a very nice piece by Alain Braff, which I hadn't seen before, and he made the nice argument, well, if you think about risk management, there is obviously also the risk, which tends to get ignored, that human efforts to stop climate change may fail, and brown assets may become very valuable, and you have the opposite, that you have decarbonized the investor portfolios, and you wish you had those brown assets that are generating all the cash flows that are needed to mitigate the climate disaster. I just wondered whether you had any thoughts within the framework how that would play out. Yeah, I know, I know the Alan, Alan Braff piece you're referring to. Um, so we haven't really thought about this because we just want to take the asset owners, asset managers, insurance, net zero alliances at their word and say, well, if you want to be net zero, here's one way to be net zero. That's pretty much, you know, how, how the paper was, uh, was uh, motivated. We're, we're responding to, to these efforts. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for a great study, great discussion, and excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you.